So I never wanted or intended to start a cult, but uh, here we are. Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Women Who Code, Vancouver's one-year anniversary rave. I've entitled it Rave because we're going to be raving hard tonight. Um, a year ago, we sat in Microsoft Garage, and it was an incredible event. But never in my wildest dreams did I expect to surpass 1,500 members in one year. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'd also like to say a special thank you to Microsoft Garage, Microsoft Vancouver, and Best Buy Canada, who is filming this, uh, this evening. So if you've missed something, you have friends that you want to share the, the event with, uh, this will be online later, uh, and slides will, will be integrated in that presentation as well. So this is me. I am Holly Peck. I am one of the founders and directors of Women Who Code Vancouver. Uh, I'm currently a research scientist at Sanctuary AI, which you'll hear about a little bit later, uh, where I'm focused on building cognitive systems for our in-house robots. So that's a little bit about what I do. Um, but enough about me. This is us. So this is Women Who Code. Everyone in this room wasn't a member of this group or organization last year. And in a year, we've done incredible things. Uh, so the strategy of my talk this evening is going to be to draw some parallelism of, you know, one small story of a woman who codes, me, my small story, and parallel that with the larger narrative that is the birth of women who code, and a few. So before software, because I wasn't always in software, uh, this was the fundamental question I was asking. And it's a little bit odd without, you know, any context, but I was asking what makes us human. And the reason why I was asking this is because when I was a junior, rising junior in university, I was invited on a archaeological dig to the Dordogne, Les Perdel, a uh, region in France, and I was invited on a Neanderthal uh, excavation site. And I cannot tell you what that experience was like for me when you're given a walk rocky quadrant of space and you're using a paintbrush to literally unearth chisel in the, in the ground uh, objects that were once held by Neanderthals. And when you, you know, hold a denticulated biface tool in your hand, you kind of think, wow, the last person, the last entity to have held this object was on the fringes of humanness. What does that mean? What is that? How did we get here? So that's the kind of question I was asking. And, I, I decided to, to get into technology because I thought, you know, in the spirit of our, of our species, why not retool myself and, uh, for, for, different, for a different vantage point on, on this one fundamental question. So I got into tech because I wanted to be this. <laughs> uh, this is a little tongue-in-cheek, but for those who don't know, uh, this is Seven of Nine. That's her Borg-designated name. And she's a member of Voyager crew. And I thought, and she works in astrometrics. And she's a boss. She's like the ultimate tech lord. Uh, and I, I, really, uh, I really loved her. I thought you know, she was just totally, totally incredible. And uh, this is my joke slide, so I want to be that. But really, no, just kidding. I didn't, I didn't really want to be that. Um, you know, software is eating the world. This is a, a term we've heard. Uh, and I thought, you know. I am really interested in social science, but the currency of our time is data. And I thought, you know what, I probably have to perform a different kind of archaeology. Maybe not in the physical sense of the word, but uh, on data itself to maybe have a new vantage point on this one, one question. So I went to a boot camp, came back to Vancouver, and was like, this is awesome. I'm going to get into tech. Let's go. Went to a tech meetup. It sucked. It really sucked, I'm not going to lie. I was like, what? I want to meet like-minded individuals. I want to I see what it is to, to be working on front-end development. What does front-end development even look like at a company as opposed to company Y and a company X? And I just had no visibility. I, did, I was missing that vantage point. Um, I didn't go to school for engineering in, in BC, so I actually went to school for anthropology in the States. So I just I missed that camaraderie. I missed that, that salon of knowledge. And I, I kept finding myself asking, like, where the heck are the women engineers? Um, I, I especially went, I remember going to a, uh, a tech agnostic meetup in, in Vancouver, which I won't, won't name. Uh, and I, I walked into the room, and I, there were two women in a, uh, in a monthly event of, like, 80. And one was the girlfriend's organizer. And one went into tech, but it was not her thing, so she went back into marketing. And I was like, oh my god, this, this, this 
If I'm experiencing this, like other women engineers are experiencing this, because I know they're out there. First milestone was starting Women Who Code and founding it with a group of incredible, incredible women uh, directors and, and co-founders. And what the intention was for this group was building a laboratory of data scientists and creatives focused on the mission of sacred knowledge transfer. That was the mission. And so we did with a couple mandates. One was keeping conversations technical. So we weren't really interested in meeting and collectively kind of ruminating about, oh, it's terrible, you know, being a woman in tech sucks. No, uh, that was kind of uh, misdirected. We wanted to kind of confer and meet and, and give code demos and learn new ideas and, and learn new technologies and frameworks and, and may, hey, maybe even start a company. Like, why not, you know? So that was kind of mandate number one. The second mandate was dropping the ego. Um, I think something happens with esoteric knowledge where the egos just are high because there's a really high barrier to entry uh, for understanding these ideas. So we really wanted to drop the ego, ego and kind of focus on a collaborative learning uh, environment. Third one was helping women pivot and stay in technology. Um, so more than 50% of women actually leave technology before reaching mid-career. Uh, and so we really wanted to um, foster a community that really empowered and encouraged women to stay stay in technology and move up the, the ladder vertically. And then, frankly, we just wanted to kind of start a salon of knowledge transfer. This also, the slide is a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, you know how it helped me. I made tech lord friends, all of y'all. I landed this cool tech lord job. I love the word tech lord, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and I learned like awesome skills. Um, but beyond that, uh, three of my very close friends actually, after having gone to one of these events, ended up enlisting and enrolling in a boot camp, came out the other end, and now are working as software engineers. So these are women who have just completely side-tooled and have gone into technology because of going to these events. And actually, one of them, it gave, gave her mobility to actually move to a different country, and she wouldn't have been able to even think about that uh, as a possibility for her. So that was really, really how it helped me uh, in a more personal, personal note. Um, and how it's helped us. So look around. We have changed technology culture in Vancouver by creating a, a locus of, of knowledge transfer and knowledge sharing. We've fostered a new image of what an engineer looks like. That's amazing when you think about that. And of course, we've connected knowledge transfer with actionable opportunity, meaning we've, you know, Women Who Code since launching has given away countless tickets to events, um, promoted the visibility of en women in hard engineering by allowing them to demo projects, uh, sometimes even talk about and recruit other engineers without going through the middleman of a recruiter who doesn't probably know the difference between Java and JavaScript, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, basically a community for engineers uh, by engineers, and so that's what we've done. Uh, what we've accomplished, so I have a very favorite quote that is, uh, a statement without data is just an opinion. So here's the data. Here's what we've done in a year. Uh, in one year, we've gone from zero members to, I think, as of tonight, we've passed 1,500 members in one year. One year. We've had 50 technical speakers at these events. We've actually had 23 events in one year, which is incredible, because that's like an average of one event every three weeks. And we've connected with 35 sponsors, and three of the women in my core director team have been promoted in the last six months. Three women. That's amazing. That's also a signal that this works. Uh, and we've actually developed uh, two scholarships for, for women in our community, so that's amazing. Um, but on a, also getting back to a more personal note, uh, Women Who Code changed my life. And the reason why it changed my life is because I got to interface with people who I didn't even know existed. Uh, I got to learn things that I didn't even think were possible. And I actually got to meet my future boss at one of our events at Clio when she came and spoke to us about the very, very cool technology that she was building. Um, recently as well, uh, when I did end up eventually taking a role at Kindred, um, I was invited to another company uh, which spun out of Kindred, basically with, with her primary mandate being uh, developing artificial general intelligence. 
Um, and, and this journey has been absolutely amazing because I found myself asking the same question. Except now I'm not in a physical space unearthing you know, objects from the ground, but I'm in a robot lab. And I'm asking the same question from a different vantage point. And I'm asking this question with an amazing group of individuals. Uh, our core team consists of four women, scientists and engineers and artists as well. And uh, one awesome fearless leader as well, Jordi Rose, which is sitting right there. Um, but together we are asking this question and we've all come from different vantage points. So a little bit about our future to end. Uh, the focus of 2018 is really going to be on delivering more workshops, more technical workshops. My co-director, uh, Zainab, is also focused on building a data science workshop in the coming months, so that's going to be amazing. Um, and we really want uh, to keep this idea of, of existing as a sanctuary for, for technical women alive. And within that vein, also broadening the pipeline for younger engineering talent by by interfacing with high school students so we can you know, pair early decision making into actionable um, job opportunities in the, in the real world. And one of my goals as well is uh, to surpass 10,000 members in five years. And just for some perspective, um, the Women Who Code Toronto chapter has been uh, in existence since 2014. They've held 56 events in four years and their membership is 2,100. We've surpassed, or we are surpassing membership, 1,500 in one year. So that just gives you kind of a glimpse of where we're heading and where I want the focus and the epicenter of technology to be in Canada, in Vancouver. Um, and to end this uh, first part of our evening, I'd like to thank you because you are, you know, our founding members. And I really hope this, this group continues to exist before, before my time here. And, you know, maybe one day synthetic humans will be a part of it. So thank you so much. Everyone. Uh, twizzle means tweet, by the way. So drop me a twizzle. That's my, uh, my Twitter. Uh, so now I would like to invent, uh, invite to the stage Dr. Suzanne Gildert. She is Sanctuary's fearless leader and CEO, and she will be delivering her, uh, her talk. Awesome. So this is really exciting, and um, when I found out that this is the one-year anniversary and it was going to be a robot rave, I thought it'd be awesome to talk about something that's a little weird and maybe different. So I thought, oh, I should probably do a really hardcore coding talk, so you know I sound really clever and stuff. <laughs> but then I just thought, you know, why not just talk about something really fun and weird and different at this interesting uh, one-year event. Okay, so as Holly mentioned, uh, I'm currently the founder and CEO of a new company called Sanctuary. It's actually very new. It was only incorporated just earlier this month. And our mission as a company is to create um, synthetic individuals, essentially robots that are indistinguishable from human. So we want to bring the, sh the show Westworld to life with less of the violence and the killing and the raping. <laughs> So basically, you want to create a nice uh, version of, of Westworld where humans and robots can live together in harmony and symbiosis and basically explore what we can become together. Okay, so how did this all start? So I'm not going to talk today about what Sanctuary is or what we're doing or how we're doing it. What I thought I'd focus on is why we're doing what we're doing. And because this is Women Who Code, I thought I might answer the question, why do I code? And I think this might be inspirational for other people to ask. Okay, so I wasn't always in AI and robotics. I was actually originally a physicist. And even before that, I was really originally an artist. So I always had this kind of uh, conflict in my background of whether to go into science or whether to go into art. So what I'm hoping to show today is that you can combine these two and science and art might not be as far apart as people think. So um, I, did, I did physics at university, and um, while I was doing physics, I found out about this super interesting uh, community of people called transhumanists. And I, I can't remember exactly how I found out about this. I think it was just like browsing Facebook one day, and I came across a, a meetup group that was like, learn about cryonics 
And I was like, what's Cranix? This sounds interesting. So I like clicked on it. And basically, I went to this meetup in London. And this was in the UK. And all these, like, I met all these crazy people who were into things like freezing their bodies after they died so they could be resuscitated one day in the future. And like implanting nanotechnology into their body and looking for ways to radically extend their lifespan so they can live a thousand years. And I was like, holy shit, this is really cool. <laughs> like, I've never met people like this before. I love it. But the really, really interesting thing that got me hooked on this kind of idea of the transhumanist community was this one idea which was called mind uploading. So mind uploading is basically the idea of after you die, you take your brain, you slice it into tiny pieces, and you scan each piece using like a scanning electron microscope, and then you take all those images and you reconstruct the brain in a, in a simulation. And basically, you can have some form of digital immortality. So I was like, this is really cool. You know, I love this idea. And I started thinking, like, could, could we actually do this within my lifetime? Is this a technology that, that's possible? And so I read a bit about it. And you know, it really didn't sound that possible because we needed all this scanning microscope technology that we didn't have yet. And it was obviously a very long time, a very uh, far in the future kind of technology. So a couple of years later, I read this book by one of my favorite sci-fi authors called Greg Egan. Uh, the book's called Zendegi. And it's a really, really cool sci-fi story. Everyone should read it. But one of the main premises is that they do something similar to the mind uploading, but they call it side loading. It's a little bit different. So in side loading, you don't need to kill a person, slice their brain up, <laughs> and put it through a microscope. You can do it while they're still alive. So you basically put them in a big, fancy, futuristic MRI machine. And you actually look at what their brain's doing in real time, and then you use that to transfer to a model in real time, like a neural net. You're kind of, you're kind of loading from one from the organic brain into an inorganic brain. That's why it's called side loading. So this was like, hmm, this is kind of cool. This is a little bit closer to what I want to do. You know, I don't want to like have my brain sliced. Um, I want to kind of do it in real time. So that was kind of inspiring. And then I found out about other people that were working on projects where you didn't actually need to look inside the brain at all. So there's this guy in you called, uh, oh, I know him now, I didn't know him at the time, called David Hansen, who makes these incredibly lifelike robots. They're really cool. And he made one which was, he calls it a robot portrait of the, the sci-fi author Philip K. Dick. And he actually built a robot that looked exactly like Philip K. Dick and then he took all of his writings, all of his stories, all of his letters, everything, and he used that to make some kind of chatbot software that brought this robot to life. So he'd actually taken the essence of a real person and created a robot that mimicked this person. So I like to think of this as an extreme case of sideloading, where you're sort of sideloading the behaviors rather than actually like looking right into the brain. So at this point, I was like, wow, this is technology we have today. We, we can actually really do stuff like this, so it might be worth thinking about. So I started thinking, okay, can I really do this? Being an artist, artists are always into the idea of self-portraits for some reason. You know, you have to do one at some point in your life as an artist. So I was like, okay, I want, I want to do a self-portrait. I want to make myself into a robot so that it can go on living like beyond the time when my physical body can. So it's like, OK, I'm a practical person. I want to do this. I don't just want to bullshit about it at these like sci-fi meetups. I want to actually do it. So how can we do it? So uh, I started writing a checklist, a requirements checklist for what you'd need to do to basically take your mind, upload it into a robot, and have that robot be indistinguishable from you as a, as a physical human. And my first thought was, OK, I'm going to need a lot of personal data. So it's like me. So the first thing I thought of was, right, I need to get life logging. So I got into this idea of extreme life logging, which is basically like trying to record every single thing that you do, everything you feel, you think, every place you've been to, every memory you've had, all this kind of stuff. So I now have giant stacks of hard drives with a lot of data on them that forms uh, the, this extreme life log. So I was collecting all this data. But I was also thinking there's something missing. You can't just have all this data and not have a way to use it to create this, this portrait of a person. And what's missing is some kind of underlying framework that you can somehow import that data into. You need a fabric in which the data can be infused and can actually create some kind of realistic mind. 
So I came up with a short list of three items that forms the sort of framework. You need a human-like body, you need a human-like brain or mind, and you need human-like values or a motivation system. So these were the three things I came up with that you need if you want to build a human-like robot. Okay, let's start with bodies. A lot of people ask me why you build human-like robots, and it's pretty obvious if you answer with the side-loading question, I want, to, I want to upload myself into a robot so it has to kind of look like me, but that's not usually the answer I give. There's actually a lot of good reasons for building human-like robots that aren't just this. For example, they'll be able to use the same tools that we use. We have a lot of infrastructure that already exists that humans use. Uh, I could go on with many, many more reasons, but the real reason that drives me is this, this idea that if you have very human-like robots and we have human-like humans, then these two entities will be able to merge with each other more easily. If you want to transfer the mind of one entity to another entity, it helps if all the control systems are the same. You know, if you're training a, a fighter plane pilot and then you put them in a completely different system like a space shuttle, they're going to be more confused than if you put them into a similar fighter plane. Right? So we want, to, we want to transfer the mind into a body that's very similar to its original body. This is really cool because human-like robotic bodies have been improving quite a lot over the past couple of decades. Not as fast as Moore's Law. So, so hardware and, and mechanical engineering systems don't go as fast as Moore's Law, but they are going faster than you might think. So sensor technology is improving all the time. Actuator technology is actually improving. And then all these technologies that have been driven by other industries like battery technology, now with electric cars, Everything is coming down in price, it's shrinking, it's getting better. So we're actually able to create better and better robots every year. Things like being able to 3D print with carbon fiber and stuff like this, it just, it just really changes the game. So this uh, is currently one of the kind of the best body candidates I have for sideloading myself into a robot. It's not perfect, but uh, it's fully actuated, so it, it basically has a lot of similar degrees of freedom to a human body. It can walk, you know, it can move around, it can manipulate objects. It's reasonably good. Control system isn't quite there yet, that's why we need the mind, but the body is not bad. Oh, and by the way, I have a cat too, so when I upload myself, I'm going to upload my cat too and have a robot cat. Okay. So we also need some minds. So we've got the bodies now, we need minds. So the other cool thing is that when you constrain something to have to be human-like, it gives you a starting point for how to craft a mind. Because you can look at the human brain and how it actually evolved, and that can actually act as, as a sort of a source of information for how to start building a mind. So uh, at previously at Kindred, I started sort of looking into this along with my colleagues. And uh, we're continuing that work at Sanctuary. What we're trying to do is build minds that are complete cognitive architectures that do everything that human brains do. And we don't just want the parts that most AI people think about. We don't want, just want it to be able to play chess or like do advanced calculus or prove theorems. We want this thing to be really human-like. So it's gonna be emotional. It's gonna make irrational decisions. It's gonna be like, really nervous when it gives talks, <laughs> like, okay. So we actually, we actually uh, build this cognitive architecture that we're designing based on the way the brain evolved. And there's another really cool reason for doing that, which is you can test it in an incremental fashion. So you can start with something like a little robot like the one I have here. It's like a little, you might think of it as a little insect kind of analogous uh, animal body. Uh, this one, is called Hydraulica, uh, which actually Holly named it. So that's pretty cute. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's really cute, sorry. <laughs> uh, and basically this is a really simple robot. All it does is it, it moves its head around, it can look at things, it has a camera, it has microphones sticking out, and it has a little speaker. And so it can make noises, it can listen, it can look at things and move around. Uh, but you can use that to do basic things like um, you know, tracking, attention, uh, listening to voices. So you can do a, lo a lot of things with a little robot like that. 
So once you've mastered the bug robots, you move on to something more highly evolved like a cat robot. I'm a big cat fan, so you'll see a lot of cat references here. So this is one of our uh, quadruped robots. It's like kind of styled to look a bit like some kind of freakish cat. Uh, <laughs> and the, the, the thing about this is it has a lot more degrees of freedom. So now you, you have to build a brain that's able to control a body that's actually mobile in the world. So the little bug robot was pretty static. It didn't have to figure out the, the AI problem of how to navigate in an environment. These kind of robots do. But like, it's good to use animal robots because they don't have the requirements of like, high-level language and things like that. You can do a lot of experiments in the AI world without needing that high-level stuff. Then, once you've mastered animals, you can move on to babies because that's like the next step in this you know, evolution follows kind of childhood development argument. Uh, so this is a little, little baby robot I have called Jensen. I love him with a mother's love, but <laughs> most people find him kind of creepy. <laughs> uh, and he has all the degrees of freedom that basically the human body has. He's just small. And one of the reasons you want to keep these kind of robots small is when you're experimenting with the minds, they do a lot of things you don't want them to do, like trial and error reinforcement learning. So you want to keep the robot small so it can't, like, hurt you <laughs> very much when it's exploring its environment. Okay, so that's Jensen. And then once you've, once you've mastered babies, you can also, with these, start to look at, you know, language formation, things like that, have them start communicating with people, this kind of thing. And then you move on to the large adult humanoids, which are kind of shown already. So you start trying to build an AGI mind for that guy. What happens next? Right, you're done right. No, because it still doesn't look like a human. So next, you want to build a really human-looking robot. So this is me with uh, one of our latest models, uh, the Harmony robot. And she's actually only got an actuated head at the moment, which is why we're still working with the fully actuated humanoids that look very much more robotic. But in future, these kind of things will be fully actuated, and they'll be indistinguishable from humans. So that's how we get to Westworld. Okay, so there's one final thing I want to talk about, which is uh, the values. So we've got a body and we've got a brain for that body, but that's not all you need. You also need a value system or a motivation system. So the thing with um, brains in, and neural nets and things in general is you can train them and you can give them a lot of data, but often they involve things like reinforcement learning where you have to give them a sense of what's good and a sense of what's bad. And that just doesn't really come out of the data that easily. So we have to find a way to get these values into robots. And remember, we want to build something really human-like, so these values have to be very human-like too. So how do we do this? OK, there's kind of an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is you get a human. Here is, this is me in a, a, teleop, a teleop rig. So it's like a full, full body suit. You can, can take control of a robot and you can move it analogously. And this was actually the technology that we was used to get Kindred going. And it's actually now being used in industrial robot products as well. But it was always uh, in, initially meant for the kind of sideloading of human values into robots. So if you can give robots training data that comes from a human teleoperating them, they kind of automatically... Uh, gather the values that that human has as well. So if a human, like, you know, picks up a microphone and throws it across the room and hits someone on the head, then what you're telling the robot is that's a good thing to do. You should think, do more things like that. Uh, <laughs> like, okay, there, there are lots of examples, but basically what you show the robot to do, um, to do is, is imparting somehow what you think it is right to do as a human. So you can do this, and this is really cool, and you can get a pretty good side-loaded value system this way just by giving it good training data. But that's not good enough, because as soon as a human steps away from that robot, it'll only ever be able to do things in the style of what it's already seen. So it won't be able to adapt to new changing circumstances. Uh, it won't be able to really understand how to apply those values to novel situations. So you actually need to bake in uh, a, f a full reward system in addition to this. And when you build a full reward system that's based on the human reward system, which can be thought of as something like Maslow's hierarchy, that teleop component just is now just a part of this. It's analogous to when you have a little kid and you're like, don't do that. 
yes, that was really good. <laughs> that's now like the tally up part. But that's just a really small part of a huge set of, of uh, intrinsic values and motivations that we have evolved to have as humans. So what you can do is you can actually go in and design a reward function system, like something like this, and that's what we do. Oops. OK. So <laughs> I've been talking a lot about AGI and how to build a kind of a human-like mind in a robot and what that might look like. Uh, but I want to come back to this sort of like lifelong quest I've had to create this sort of self-portrait thing. Um, and I wanted to say that the Kindred has like taken me on a, a, a path where I went into this AGI thing in depth, and I think building the mind is actually the hardest part of doing all this. But once we have that, once we have robots that look like us and they're walking around using their generalized reward functions that are very similar to humans, they're doing everything we can do, I think at that point, building these Android copies of specific people will become commoditized. So I think if you can build a robot that's generally like a human, it then won't be much more effort to go from that to something that looks like a specific human. So for example, I think in the future there'll be companies that you go to and you go into a room and they scan you and then they build you a robot copy of yourself. It's not that hard, it's already been done. <laughs> like these things already exist. And I think what will happen is you'll get one of these things, you'll probably get a teleoperation suit with it and you'll be able to fully immerse yourself in that robot's sensory motor system, you'll be able to go out and it'll be like the movie Surrogates, if anyone's seen that, where you're just like taking control of a robot body and basically going and doing things in the world, like attending conferences in remote places. <laughs> okay, so I think this will really become a commodity. And then I also think there'll be another class of companies, maybe the same companies, that will take all this data people have and it will use that to add extra information to these systems. So if you have a robot that looks like yourself and you can teleoperate it, you can sort of sideload some of your values into it by showing it what to do. You can show it your mannerisms. You can like, it can learn your voice. You know, it can learn that you like go to Starbucks every morning and get a coffee. But one thing it can't learn is what you've done in the past. Because by definition, that's already happened, <laughs> so it can't. So what, what you could do with this data is you might be able to have programs that could cleverly inject memories into this robot so that it behaved as though those things had actually happened to it. So in like, um, in like the Blade Runner universe, sorry, I always use sci-fi as like the go-to here. <laughs> I'm a big sci-fi fan. Uh, in the Blade Runner universe, they have this idea of implanted memories, or they've given the replicants memories that never actually happened to them. You could imagine a technology like that in the future. We don't really have it yet, which is why I'm still collecting data and not doing anything with it. But I think in the future we'll have something like that. So that's really cool. So um, just to come full circle on this thing, uh, I was originally an artist and a scientist, and I could never really decide which one I was. My parents said going to science because you'll never make any money in art, so I did. Um, but I always wanted to find a way to kind of bring those two things together. So this like idea of the, the left brain and the right brain. And I think a project like this, creating human-like robots that replicate individual people, is a really cool way to combine both science and art. So you've got the science of like the hard math of the backprop in the neural nets and the mechanical engineering of creating like a skeleton that can, you know, move a certain payload and all this. But then on the other hand, you've got this like really creative artistic component, which is making the thing look like a person, making all the little subtle mannerisms correct um, and, and crafting its mind to be as beautiful as a human mind. So I think that bringing these two things, science and art, together has been one of the, one of the most uh, coolest parts about the whole, uh, the projects that I've been involved in. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I just wanted to finish by saying that I'd like to give the same talk again in 20 years, maybe 30 years time, exact same talk, but I'll be using the past tense instead of the future tense when I talk about what I've done and I'll be my Android form, which will look just like me. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so now we have...
we have time for a couple questions. Oh, uh, yeah. We can start with that one. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. I'm just curious how big, because we saw the adult robot is yeah. Like yeah. But how big is it? Uh, it's about the size of a toddler. It's like about the size of a three year old, maybe, okay. when it's fully. The adult one is about five foot five. It's about the same height as me. Oh. Yeah. Sorry? The one that you were like. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the same height. Yeah, so I think it's really important to like take the concerns seriously. I think a lot of the concerns are a little overhyped because of Hollywood movies have really scared people, but I think some of them are really valid. Like the example of um, weaponizing AI, I think is really um, something that you know is terrifying. <laughs> Um, the, one of the reasons that both at Kindred and Sanctuary is we never wanted to go into that side of things is because it's, it's kind of scary and we want to build AI that can actually work with humans uh, and provide things that uh, humans can't even provide nowadays. So I love the idea of um, things like using these systems in education. So you'd have a teacher that doesn't just know about one branch of science, say, but knows about all branches of science in the same depth as like the most expert academic researchers. And you could imagine a system like that uh, that could, you know, uh, form a like a, a hive mind across all like robots who are doing science research or something like that. So that would be really cool. Uh, another good reason that, that we want to make the robots very human-like is this thing I was talking about was uh, them inheriting our own value systems. So if they're very like us, they'll understand the things that affect us and the things that we think are bad, and it it will apply to them as well. So just something as simple as an AI that uh, had its arm cut off and knew that, and that was part of, that was like baked into its pleasure pain system at a very low level, will understand that cutting a human's arm off is really bad because they'll be able to like empathize with that using their mirror neuron system and, and their own kind of like imaginings. So I think if you try and make them, if you make them as human as possible, then there'll be, there'll be less uh, conflict because they'll, they'll share values with us. But I do agree it's a, it's a hard problem going forward. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, you, yes. <laughs> Bridget, yeah. So tying into that last question, so a lot of people are very concerned about jobs and how that can affect jobs. Yep. So do you have an answer about that? Um, controversial. <laughs> jobs are going away. Whether or not we have advanced AI, I think you don't need advanced AI. I think automation is going to take jobs away anyway. Uh, from it's kind of happening for both ends at the moment. You have like um, very repetitive jobs being automated, just using kind of like um, pr systems that are pretty simple to program. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have very high level like expert jobs like radiology that are also being automated just by kind of classifiers, things like that. The ones in the, the middle where you need some level of manual dexterity, some level of like social empathy, and some level of like, you know, physical ability, those will be the last to go, but I still think those could be automated away too. So I think what we need to do is start thinking about ways as a society that we could actually um, move forward if there were no jobs. So, you know, everyone should do a thought experiment. If all the jobs went away tomorrow, what should we do? You know, how should we structure, um, you know, uh, government systems and, and economic systems and things like that? But there's, again, there's no easy answer to this question. But I don't, I just don't think that, that things like AI should, should take the blame. I think it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, we need to think about it. Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, let's see. I well, okay. I really like the uh, the sort of Renaissance polymaths, like you know Leonardo da Vinci and people. Like, obviously, I can't meet them because they're not here anymore. Maybe we could resurrect them. Um, but I, I like the idea that not everyone has to become really, really deep expert in something without considering like the broader. Um, uh, disciplines and how things might intersect with one another. So uh, 
the, I guess the archetype of the person I really admire is the person that's able to do some art and some science and some like, you know, engineering uh, and things like that. So not really specific people, but that kind of archetype is what I really think is cool. Yeah, you? So uh, besides going to conferences for us and uh, teaching and taking mm -hmm. jobs, Um, well, obviously, the the use case of the being things that that don't really exist yet, and are kind of interesting. So the thing about the uh, like the the perfect scientist or the superhuman scientist is really interesting to explore because you could have this idea of the the robot minds. Uh, this this sounds awful when you say like Borg mind, but I think in some cases a Borg mind would be really cool. Like say if you could make a Borg mind of all the cancer researchers in the whole world and have them kind of share all their knowledge and make intuitive findings based on that, that would be really cool. So I like the idea of exploring use cases that are slightly outside of the realm of what humans do currently. <laughs> um, one really interesting use case I'm kind of... Um, looking at is the idea of like companionship. So I think there's a lot of people are very lonely and socially isolated and it may or may not be because of technology. So there's an argument you might be making it worse by putting robots in, but if these robots are very human-like, then I think it will actually help rather than make it worse. They'll make people more, more social because they're interacting with something that's very human-like. Uh, yes? You, yeah, no, you. Well, there's no, I mean, there's no kind of specific regulations around AI at the moment, other than, you know, just being law abiding and generally following like the codes of ethics that relate to humans uh, and other people. I don't, I mean, I'm kind of, I, d I don't really want it to the field to be so regulated that no one can practice and that other countries then start kind of taking the lead in these things. But I also think that we have to like think very carefully about what we're doing here ethically. So um, a really good example, uh, I actually had a talk I gave on robot ethics, which is like kind of the answer to this question. But one thing we have to do every day is when we do an AI experiment, we create something called a mind file. We have to decide at the end of the experiment whether to delete that mind file or like archive it or you know run it on another robot and it's kind of you know it's all like fun when it's like a little neural net and it's doing something interesting but then at some point that thing gets smart enough that it might be considered to be an actual like a creature so if, is it ethical to then delete that mind is it ethical to run these uh, uh, reinforcement learning experiments on it where you're deliberately putting it in pain so you can test its pain system so the, there are a lot of questions that we have to ask ourselves even today when we're doing AI research. And we've really just been following our intuition of what um, the best kind of ethics we know of is currently. So it's, it's very much up to the people that are, that are designing and developing things at the moment, being what, what everyone might consider good humans. Yes? Yep. So who gives these robots the goals? Because you may have something you want the robot to do, and, and, and you know, if you really made it like you, it might say, no, I want to make a better self-portrait than you did. And, yep. and so, so you know, they be, they're, they're more like copies up to a certain point, but don't give them free will. You know, they're really slaves or something like that. Mm -hmm. and it, it, obviously, this is, yep. this is not all the way where you are now, but, I, you know, what are you, what are you thinking there? Are you trying to make autonomous... Yes. So the way I think about this is that there's kind of uh, it, it's very similar to when you when you raise a child. So a whole bunch of the motivations kind of get come along for the ride from evolution. So things like you know aversion to pain, things like hunger, all these kind of things they're just built in. So we just build those in and we try and make them as, as human like as possible. Then there's this sort of uh, what I call the, the social side-loading of the values. So that's like taking the child and then teaching it 
what we know as a society. So saying like, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, you can do that. But then um, after that, the, the uh, system really has to then decide for itself when it goes out there in the world, and it's, again, it's very similar. Uh, you, you, you raise the, um, the child as well as you can, but at some point they go out there into the world and the power turns off. <laughs> 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 Creepy. <laughs> yeah, so at some point they like go out there into the world and then they get to make their own decisions and what they're basing those decisions on is all those inbuilt instincts plus the instincts you've kind of uh, built into them. Uh, and I think we should follow that model. I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's a better model because I don't think you should just, um, this is kind of the Isaac Asimov thing. I don't think you can just say, you know, uh, picking up litter is always good and throwing microphones at people is always bad. I think if you try to hard bake these really specific rules into a robot and don't tell it anything else, I think you'll end up with these like loophole scenarios. So I think you have to give it a very broad framework of very general things that we think are good and bad as a society. We have time for two more questions. Uh, at the back, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I always kind of did them in parallel. <laughs> so I didn't, I, I didn't really switch between them, maybe change focus a little bit, but I always did um, science and technology as like the main path and then tried to do art as uh, like, a, like a minor. <laughs> Um, keep them both going in parallel and then I'm just glad now I've been able to find some way that they merge together because I, I knew there was some some way I just didn't know what it was <laughs> so I mean there, there are other things you can do if your if your mind works like this like another thing I thought about was going into web design because I just love the idea of um, the design meeting like the hard tech parts of, of web coding as well so that was something else I but the, the reason I kind of chose this is because I really a very like hands-on person I like building things I was always like a kind of maker type person so I, I just thought robotics is a really uh, good thing to go into okay last question in the back with the scarf yes yeah That's right. My question is, how likely is a robot to go beyond this current human? Uh, it can be by like, predictive behavior, trend of the human, or the change of the size or likes or dislikes, or even thinking better than human. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, it's something I've thought about a bit as well because it's like, okay, you want to create a portrait of yourself, but by definition, it's kind of a snapshot at one point in time. Um, but this thing will be a living entity. So, I mean, this is like addressed a lot in science fiction. This, um, what's called the copy paradox, I think, uh, which is when, it, when you create a copy of yourself, it starts to diverge straight away. And it's not really the same person anymore. Like a microsecond after you've copied it, it starts to have slightly different experiences. Even if it's stood right next to you, it's like looking at a different part of the room or something. It's getting different data. Its neural weights are changing. So I think um, that's going to happen. And I think you have to decide whether you want to make multiple copies of, of yourself or of a specific person over time as that person changes and then have them continue to diverge from that point or whether you just want to always try and keep this like perfect, well, <laughs> perfect, no one's perfect, but this like very high fidelity copy of a specific person at a specific time. Uh, and I, I, I think I prefer this idea of it uh, taking a copy at a specific time, but then letting it see where it wants to go after that. So it's kind of like uh, myself in another branch of the multiverse. That's kind of how I like to think about it. 
Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's a question we're going to have to answer as well. So one, one thing I've thought about is at what point do you want to make the copy? Because if you leave it too late, your own mind starts deteriorating and you really wouldn't want to copy a version of yourself that was, say, in the really late stages of Alzheimer's or something like that. So at that point, you might want something that's like a copy of something earlier, an earlier version of you, uh, which then you might consider to be more you than you are now. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, on that note, uh, let's give our presenter <laughs> a round of applause. That's awesome. Thanks. Great. As uh, we all know, this is uh, the second installment of the, of the evening, and we're moving toward uh, our panel discussion, which is uh, themed women or leaders in data, data science and robotics. Um, so for the first part of this panel, uh, I'm just going to ask a, a series of questions. Uh, to, the, to the panelists here. And then we're going to do something really interesting. Uh, then I'm going to move on toward a, uh, the second part, which is going to be a little, bit, uh, a little bit fun. And this is where I'm going to ask the, uh, the panelists um, the Proust questions from the Proust questionnaire. So if you guys uh, are not familiar with that, I will, I will get to that uh, later. Uh, first, though, I want to introduce everyone. Uh, so Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Gildert, she just gave a fantastic presentation. She is the CEO and founder of Sanctuary AI. Formerly, she was the CSO and founder of Kindred, where she overs oversaw the design of and engineering of the company's human-like robots. Um, before Kindred, she worked at D-Wave, designing and building superconducting quantum processors, and as a researcher in quantum artificial intelligence software applications. So that is Suzanne. Olivia Norton, at the end, is uh, the founder and CTO of Sanctuary AI. Uh, formerly, she also worked as a senior engineer in the AGI group at Kindred, where she helped in the development of cognitive architectures for robotic control. She holds a bachelor with distinction in computer science from University of Calgary, uh, sorry, computer engineering from University of Calgary, and a master's in engineering from UBC. Uh, before joining Kindred, she worked as a software consultant and as a research in, uh, assistant at ETH, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. So thank you for joining us, Olivia. Dr. Angelica Lim, uh, Dr. Angelica Lim, raise your hand, yes, uh, has studied and worked in AI and robotics for over 10 years in Canada, France, and Japan. Uh, most recently, she spent four years as a software engineer and manager at SoftBank Robotics in Paris, where she led the emotion recognition team for Pepper, the humanoid robot. Uh, she's been featured in on BBC, given talks at South by Southwest, TEDx, hosted a TV documentary on robotics, and was recently featured in Forbes' 20 Leading Women in AI. So give it up for Dr. Angelica Lim. And all of our panelists, not just her. Okay, give it up. Uh, Dr. Sarah Weinstein, raise your hand, yes, uh, PhD in neuroscience, is a data scientist and project lead at Boeing Vancouver Labs, where she leads the development of analytics-based solutions for Boeing's commercial customers. Sarah focuses on the application of text uh, analytics to increase efficiency in aviation maintenance and day-of-flight operations. Uh, before joining Boeing, Sarah conducted data surveillance and mortality research at the office of the chief coroner of BC. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from UBC. Pretty cool. Awesome. Okay. And then Neda Salem is a data science contractor at Microsoft's Big Park Studio. Uh, she works towards helping bring 3D, MR, and VR experiences to Microsoft applications by collecting and analyzing trends on the data. Uh, prior to becoming a data scientist, uh, Nada was a management, management consultant at EY, uh, working in, on solving business problems through structured and data-based analyses to improve client performance. Uh, and her goal, uh, to end, is to empower management to make better and more informed data-driven decisions for the organization. So give it up for our panelists. Okay, so to kick us off, Suzanne, um, let's start with you and, and just ask the, the question on everyone's mind. So how have you come to the point in your career where you're able to focus on building human androids? And I know you touched on this, but maybe you can talk about you know, uh, the progression of your career as you know, a quantum engineer turned kindred CSO and now kind of the CEO and founder of Sanctuary. Yeah, I didn't really go into that a lot. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, don't ask me a lot of questions because... Uh... 
I want these other guys to ask the question. Um, yeah, so basically I, I started um, my like formal education in physics. Uh, I did physics with electronics degree and then a PhD in physics. And it was really cool. Um, and that actually was how I found out about D-Wave because I was doing uh, work in um, superconducting quantum processes, which are used in quantum computing. And uh, so I was kind of like headhunted by D-Wave at that point because there weren't many uh, superconducting processor designers in the world. Um, and so I took a job at D-Wave as an experimental physicist, so I was still a physicist at that point. But what I found was that the, pr the processes were being applied to uh, AI applications and actually became like fascinated by AI and way more interested in AI than the quantum part of it, which was still, quantum was cool, but I had a feeling it was like quite a few years out, whereas the AI stuff was happening like right then. This is like 2010, just in the, when the deep learning stuff really started kicking off. It was just amazing. So I was like, all right, I have to do something in AI. And then um, I started like, I was also really interested in robots as a hobby. And so, I don't know, maybe it's just like a personality <laughs> thing, but I was like, how can I create a dream job? Uh, okay, let's like build robots and do advanced AI on them. And just, and also I have to like give a shout out to Jordi, who was my mentor at D-Wave. And he was the one that uh, was kind of like, D you know, don't just sit there talking about this all day. Why don't you actually start a company and do something about it? And he gave me a lot of business mentoring and experience on how to like, do startups, so I think that was that was kind of, and now I'm just addicted to it, and I want to like make loads of companies. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so Olivia, uh, as Sanctuary's founder and CTO, your role, as you have playfully described it, is a builder and mind minder. So what are some technological constraints one needs to mind when building minds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Suzanne gave us a quick synopsis of what we're up to at Sanctuary. And uh, the vision that she portrayed for us here is really founded on three kind of technical um, perfections. Uh, and those three things are the body, the mind, and the motivation, value, reward. So as we saw, the, the robotics is moving in the right direction, though we're not quite there yet. So this idea of building a strong, beautiful, agile, uh, human form that is able to take on the challenges that we take on every day is en route, so stay tuned, but we're clearly moving in the right direction. The, the question of the mind and the question of the reward value motivation systems, those are, those are really hard questions, um, and we're also moving in the right direction there. Uh, the, those two problems are the ones that I think about the most, and now having said all this, the, th the three main things that I think about are uh, flexibility, scalability, and timing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say a little bit more about all those things. Okay, so uh, let's start with scalability. So we, uh, Suzanne showed a picture of Hydraulica, our little hydro robots. Everybody at the office has a test bed robot sitting on their desk. So you, you, you need to do any sort of kind of reward modification. You test it on there first before you throw it on the human body. Uh, fair enough. But um, the compute necessary for an entity with that many degrees of freedom to learn a thing that is interesting is entirely different from the compute necessarily for somebody like you know, a human body to, to do that same thing. And so this idea of like a microservices based cognitive architecture that allows us to uh, scale when needed is really, really important. This leads me to the next question, which is the, f the flexibility part, or the next point, which is the flexibility part. And what what I like to keep in mind as we're developing this architecture is that we ideally want to provide our brain engineers with uh, a platform in which to experiment that is entirely up to them. So the, the question of human intelligence um, from the neuroscience perspective as well is not answered. And there are things that we don't know. And so therefore, rather than building for something like a, a, a client that has very specific requirements, we try to make this as a kind of open as possible for the, for, the, for the brain engineers that are doing their work. And then last but not least is the timing thing, which I know um, uh, affects all sorts of different uh, technical industries. Um, but in reinforcement learning, well, learning in general, the question of how timing impacts uh, systems' abilities to learn is important. Um, so it's just one of the things that we also change uh, regularly. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Angelica. 
So previously, as, as we all heard, uh, you worked as an engineer and manager at SoftBank's Robotics in Paris, uh, where you led the emotion recognition team for Pepper, the humanoid uh, robot. So kind of thinking about that experience, can a robot have feelings, and, and how could this work? I have a whole talk about this, but um, <laughs> first I should probably say that the following opinions do not reflect my former employer. <laughs> um, I, although working at SoftBank was great, I had a team that was 80% uh, women of engineers, mm. and we were working on kind of, if we're going back to the Westworld reference, the behavior part of um, our humanoids. So. Um, that was that. But before I joined SoftBank, I was actually doing my PhD in robots uh, in, a, in a developmental context. So we were trying to make robots that would learn like children, but in order to understand the human mind. It wasn't necessarily to do what you guys are doing, but because we realized that, have you heard that expression, in order to um, create something you have to understand it, or what we cannot create, we do not understand. So that was kind of the, uh, the thought behind it. And I started doing out in Japan, and we were building robots that would play music. And so at some point, we realized there was a huge problem. Is anybody else a musician here? Yeah, OK. So I'm a musician as well. And so I realized music, music is about feeling, right? It's about being able to feel something and express that through music. Or you can think about it as when you listen to music, somehow these weird sound waves make you feel something, right? How does sound make us feel happy or sad? So when we're thinking about robots or ourselves, how does that work? How are we able to feel these bodily feelings from things like sounds? And so uh, I spent, I was telling Sarah that I spent half of my time in my PhD reading neuroscience papers and the other half reading psychology papers, trying to figure out if anybody knew how this worked in humans. And Antonio Damasio, um, he's a neuroscientist uh, specializing in emotions, he defines feelings as the expression of flourishing or distress in the mind and body. And so, long story short, the idea was if a robot could have feelings, it would probably have to reflect its body. I also believe that it's necessary for a truly um, intelligent, grounded, understanding AI to have a body, um, that it would be able to ground this feeling in, its, in, in how it feels. So I defined robot feelings as distress, so pain, which would be like low battery um, motors that were too hot. It's kind of like babies when they're first born, they have a distress signal when they're cold or hungry or that sort of thing, and flourishing as when they're fine. So. Um, gets a little bit more calm again. But that's basically the answer to your question. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so Neda, you currently work as a data scientist uh, at Microsoft. And previously, you were a consultant at EY. Uh, so to developers in the audience who may not you know, necessarily have the, the data science skills uh, yet, uh, but who are looking to retool, um, can you talk about you know, certain technologies that help you put um, yourself above the API? Uh, from your peers and talk about your favorite uh, data science technologies? Uh, sure. I actually didn't start coding until about, say, two years ago. Oh, wow. And I never thought that I can go from being a totally non-technical person to just being able to code and being comfortable with several languages. And it all began with just taking a few courses on my own online, picking up a few books, and then eventually enrolling in a data science program here in uh, Vancouver at UBC. Uh, but definitely my favorite tools to use for data science are uh, softwares like R. Uh, there's definitely a lot of statistical tools on there, a lot of libraries that are super helpful. Um, it's a great visualization um, tool as well, using ggplot there. I, I think a lot of people don't understand how powerful it is to just put your data in a way that is understandable. Uh, by a lot of people to put the data in, in, in a plot to kind of communicate this information to a non-technical audience. And, and this is what a lot of people struggle with in that um, we have so many technical people who I'm sure can code a ton better than I can. Uh, but a lot of times, a lot of, the, a lot of the information gets lost in that they can't communicate that in English to like a non-technical audience, to business managers. and. I find it super important to be able to show 
the leadership team certain results in a visual way. Uh, that's why I, I just love doing that in R. Ever since I joined Microsoft, Power BI has been a very important tool as well. But when it comes to you know, machine learning tools and, and um, skills, I, I definitely rely on a high level programming language such as Python. Um, tools such as uh, scikit-learn are, have been so helpful for people like me and, and just you know, digging into the algorithms and trying to understand them even more. I, I feel like I can bring more value to um, the leadership or to the clients or the, the, the business that I'm in. Very cool, very cool. Uh, so Sarah, uh, as we as we heard, your background is is in you know psychology and and uh, neuroscience is pretty multivalent. Um, how has this background helped you frame data science problems in your current role? Um, yeah, so I think um, I think I've I've received two really great benefits from my varied background. And the first is that so I was working in cognitive neuroscience, and this is really the intersection of functional neuroanatomy and cognitive psychology, and I was looking at how um, changes in brain structure and brain function relate to uh, language and symptom expression in psychosis. And so it's, there's all these overlapping systems, um, and so I really, you know, five years in a PhD, it really ingrained in me this systems level thinking, a systems level approach to problems. Um, you really can't. You really can't think about uh, any single component of the systems of these interdependent sim systems um, by itself. It doesn't make sense. It's totally futile. Uh, you really have to understand the broader context of the phenomenon in order to make any progress towards understanding it. And that's something that. Um, has been really useful, actually. So I've moved into industry, and uh, it, now I have to, I have to understand my technical landscape that I'm operating within. I need to understand aviation is a very complex domain, so I need to understand the domain as well um, in order to make sure that I'm asking the right questions and solving the right problems. And I also need to consider the the business level. Um, and so being able to kind of think about all of these things at one time. Um, it, it, uh, it really helps sort of develop a skill of spotting the opportunities, like what are the right questions to ask? Where, where can I add value? Um, what are the right problems to solve? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, you know, working in um, neuroscience and then at the coroner service in what is, you know, kind of a public health or almost like epidemiological analytics setting and then to where I am now, um, it just get a lot of, different exposure to different ways of solving problems. And so I, I don't know if we have other data scientists or analysts here, but something like principal components analysis is used almost exclusively for data reduction and feature engineering. Um, but we used it when I was doing uh, functional brain imaging. We used it um, to identify functional, neural, functional networks in the brains. Uh, and I think that if I hadn't had that, uh, that experience of seeing how these tools can be used in different ways. You know, if you only ever see something done one way, um, maybe that's a bit limiting. And so I think that my experience has, um, maybe lets me be a little bit more flexible and look a little further afield when I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to tackle a problem. Very cool. Uh, so Suzanne, fear and competition are part of human nature. And humans, as we've known throughout history, uh, are inherently xenophobic. So as someone who's passionate about you know, bringing new symbiotic forms of life into society, how can humans be, be, be welcoming to AGI? Ooh, that's tricky. <laughs> um, well, I think if the, well, this is what I always say, but I think if they start off by, by looking like humans, it's a lot easier. We have this, um, we have this tendency to anthropomorphize things. So if you if you watch a lot of the Pixar movies, then they'll they'll go to great lengths to you know make 
a, a little character that looks nothing like a human, very personable. They'll make it into a character that you can fall in love with or, you know, makes you cry when it gets to the sad part of the movie and things like that. And I think a lot of what needs to go into robots is um, an aesthetic component. So we kind of try and get over this uncanny valley effect. Um, we can go into something that's very human-like, very lifelike, and that will make us, you know, instantly have some kind of bond with them because we feel like they're really human. But then I think you also need a deeper part, which is um, this making the the things that the, the robot feels, um, uh, like was said earlier, to, to be things they're really feeling. So basically what I mean is you can't fake it. So you can't make an AI that's like, oh, I'm so sad today because it's raining when it's like a speaker on your desk. It's like <laughs> just little th things like that don't really, <laughs> they, they, you know, they cue us wrongly. And I think if, if the robot says like, I'm in pain because look, my arm just got cut off and all my like wires are dangling out and I've been programmed to feel pain, then I think it'll, it'll, it'll like, you know, we'll understand that a lot more and we'll be more empathetic to them. So I think I think we have to make them, um, we have to first make them human-like so we get that initial like kind of bond and interest in them and then I think you have to go deeper and kind of not, not like get, get away from this uh, wanting to, to fake it and like do it properly from the ground up uh, like Angelic was saying. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, moving to Angelica. Thank you, Suzanne, for segueing. Uh, so we haven't really talked about your new, um, new project that you recently founded. So can you talk about uh, Rosie Lab and what the mission is? Uh, yes, so at SFU, oh, just get that. Um, aside from teaching wonderful students computing science, uh, I am starting a new lab called Rosie Lab. It stands for Robots with Social Intelligence and Empathy. Um, my goals are not to build a human looking robot, actually. It's, it might be humanoid robots, but I want them to always be distinguishable from humans. Uh, three missions. The first is to make robots that can interact smoothly with us so and, and be useful. So thinking about Rosie from the Jetsons, I don't know if you knew that. Um, uh, useful, but also with a bit of personality and funny and, you know, not the subservient necessarily, completely subservient type, but something a little bit like Bender, kind of, you know, kind of funny. Um, and... I think that in order to get there, which is kind of like if you're familiar with the Turing test, like this would be a robot Turing test, the ability to smoothly interact with this robot um, like another human. Um, the second thing is I think in order to get that, we need to have robots that can understand what we're feeling. Um, it's empathy, um, it's theory of mind. For I'll give you an example. So let's say you the robot's coming down, the, down here, and you step in front of it. Would the robot be able to tell if you did that by accident or if you're doing that on purpose? What would you do differently? Today, you, it just, oh, you're an obstacle. I'm just going to turn around and go away. But it, if it could understand from the way you act and what you're doing and thinking maybe past history, like, oh, okay, oh, sorry, and it could apologize or something. Simple stuff like that. And then thirdly, the last mission is looking into neuroscience and psychology for inspiration to get there, because I don't think we're going to be able to do it alone. I really think that as computing scientists, we know how to compute, but we don't necessarily know, we don't definitely don't know as much as the community of neuroscientists know there uh, about the human mind. So those are kind of the, the missions for my lab. Very cool. Uh, Olivia, you have a very interesting background. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to venture into AI? Yeah. Um, so I started out in uh, engineering, as was mentioned, uh, computer engineering, and I, I focused on uh, biomedical engineering, actually, in my undergrad. Uh, in my undergrad, I was presented with uh, the first taste of AI, and it was really a straightforward uh, neural fuzzy and soft computing course. And it was enough to kind of make me ask a bunch of questions and not provide uh, any answers. I, I worked for a little while in industry, but realized that really wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, and during that time, one of my experiences that sort of shifted my perspective was an introduction to meditation um, that got me thinking a lot about the, the, the presence and the experience side of what the mind is doing in something as simplistic as those neurofuzzy 
um, kind of networks that I was introduced to in my undergrad. And I started putting those two pieces together. And uh, when I returned to school to do my master's, I was actually really hoping to, to study the um, effects of meditation on the mind, but from a, like a computational perspective. Um, what ended up happening in my master's was I got as much of an introduction to all the fields of machine learning and AI that I could get, get a handle on in my two years. And uh, during that time, I also found Kindred and then spent the following three years working with Kindred uh, developing these cognitive architectures. So, Very cool. Uh, to Sarah. So, you know, the words, phrases, you know, machine learning, you know, disciplines, machine learning, AI, and data science, you know, seem ubiquitous to us now. Um, but for those in the audience who aren't familiar uh, with uh, AI and, and data science, can you talk about the difference between you know, data science, machine learning, and then artificial intelligence? Uh, sure. I don't know if I'm the best person on this <laughs> panel to talk about artificial <laughs> intelligence, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so a kind of flippant answer is that I, I am a data scientist. I do machine learning. I think about artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> As, you know, data science is a, it's a vocation. It's an interdisciplinary practice. Um, it's really focused on um, mining insights out of data to inform business decisions. You know, it's, it's something you do to add value, usually to an in industry. Um, why, why science? I've always found that kind of interesting, that we call ourselves data scientists. As a, someone who's trained as a neuroscientist, it slightly offended me in the <laughs> beginning. Um, I've kind of come around. Uh, and the idea is just that it is supposed to kind of employ the same principles um, of, of scientific thinking. So it's supposed to be based on objectivity and learning from observation, experimentation, and hypothesis testing, and all of that. Um, and so machine learning is just it's a, it's a tool. It's a set of techniques that, that you can use um, to analyze your data. And they, they could be... Um, unsupervised, which are kind of descriptive methods, so you, you know, segment or cluster your data based on the attributes of the data set itself to kind of learn more about um, that data set. Or they can be supervised when you add uh, labels or um, classifications to a data set, and then you ask a computer to learn uh, what are the attributes within the data set that best predict those labels? Well, really, you're asking it to kind of to learn a function for you that you can then apply to unseen data. Um, to classify that. And so, um, actually, another uh, pet peeve of mine <laughs> is that um, recently I feel like I'm hearing um, artificial intelligence and deep learning used uh, as synony synonyms when they really are not. So deep learning is um, a, a subset of algorithms that they're just machine learning algorithms. They're, they're really fancy and impressive and they do amazing things, but um, they are just a bunch of algorithms. I think it's confusing the, the concept with an implementation of the concept. And so artificial intelligence um, is really more thinking about this question, as, as um, we've been hearing already this evening, of um, what does it mean to think like a human? And how, do we, how, can, we, how can we define that? Uh, that's just defining what intelligence is is actually not an easy thing. Um, never mind trying to build it. You know, how do we build? How do we build a machine that can reason and think and feel and make decisions and take actions? That's artificial intelligence to me. Very cool. Uh, Nada. So part of your job involves, you know, convincing maybe and helping companies become more data driven. So how do you how do you do that? Uh, well, in in today's world, you see a lot of companies kind of shifting from a trust your gut to a trust the data and trust the evidence <laughs> environment. And my job is to help facilitate that because you you hear you know there's so much data out there and you know where where is this data? How, how do I get to this data? And just like how do I do it? And I believe as a data scientist, my job is to try to build the right infrastructure to be able to access that data and you know, provide all the information necessary to be able to analyze it. And it all starts with, you know, as Sarah said, understanding the domain that you're working in and then asking the right questions. So you, you, you've got to be able to target the right questions to the right people. Uh, you talk to your, your bosses, your managers, and you say, what is our business goal? Is, is, it, is what we want short-term? Is it long-term? And then we 
try to gather as much data as possible or access as much data as possible to be able to facilitate these goals. Uh, so what people are starting to understand about the data is that you can see, it gives you a very panoramic yet very granular view on how your business environment works. And I believe a lot more people are starting to appreciate that. Very cool, very cool. Uh, so Angelica, we talked a little bit about how you know, emotions can work in robots. Uh, but how do, we, how do we teach robots emotional intelligence? How do we do that? Can we do that? There's the easy way and there's the hard way. Um, so right now, there are emotion detectors on the market. Uh, Affectiva, for example, is one company building software where it'll uh, be able to look at a face, and they use this for marketing purposes. They'll show a whole bunch of ads to people, and they'll try to track their expression to see what gets, their, gets them engaged most. Um, this is based off of Paul Ekman's six universal expression model, which imagines that there are these base set of e emotions across humanity. Um, but what's interesting is that psychology uh, is moving away from this model. It doesn't really seem like there are discrete expressions or emotions that happen in the real world. And as someone that tried to make a robot that could understand these expressions, I totally agree. In real life, uh, we don't go around going, <laughs> when we're angry, <laughs> usually we're actually smiling, <laughs> right? That little, like, there's like 12 different meanings for a smile, or we might laugh. Uh, we would actually laugh more in social, social situations than when we're alone. Um, I have this issue where, for example, a robot looking at me, co concentrating on the computer, it would think I was unhappy, but I'm just concentrating. <laughs> Does your partner ever say that? Like, are you angry? I'm, no, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Anyway, so. <laughs> So if you read, uh, there's a really interesting book called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Um, she's a Canadian researcher. And she talks about how uh, emotions or how we learn to interpret emotions is really based through experience and individual experience. And we know that because from culture to culture, emotions are expressed at least slightly differently. Um, I lived in Japan for six years and for sure, uh, emotions aren't expressed or used in the, in the ex exact same way. So, um, yeah, the, the hard way would be to have a robot that would go through life and learn these emotions as it goes through life, through interactions with humans that would teach them their emotions. Uh, like in one family, which was very extroverted, these emotions would be very different from another family, which is very reserved, that sort of thing. So, yeah. One way is lots of data, very actually difficult because most of the facial um, data is not anonymized. So it's hard to get that data. And then the, there's that other I interactive way. Very cool. Uh, Sarah, in general terms, uh, what excites you most about your current role at Boeing? Without um, you know, mentioning anything pri proprietary, no obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what excites me most? Um, Partly it's opportunity. Uh, aviation is, it's a really, really big industry and it's a very complex domain. So, uh, uh, and there's just mountains of data everywhere you look. So there's sensor data coming in off the aircraft. There's um, huge amounts of um, engineering data, maintenance and reliability data, um, even problems that seem like they should be simple, like crew assignments, are viciously complex, require these huge optimization models to, to get right. Um, and it's, it's an old industry, and it's airplanes, so it's very risk averse. So we are not at the bleeding edge of anything, <laughs> which means that kind of nothing has been Done. Uh, there's just so much potential. There's so much, so much data, and and the company is really the last couple of years is really kind of waking up to the idea that um, uh, there's huge value in this data. Uh, so that's really cool. There's no end of interesting problems to solve. Um, and I would also say that the team that I'm on here, we're an applied data science team. So um, there are other teams within Boeing that do more kind of data infrastructure um, or true R&D type type work. Um, we don't do that. We work very closely with our customers. Uh, we're really close to the, the business problem. Um, we do a lot of experimentation and prototyping. Um, and I really enjoy that. Um, and, and that really close contact with um, 
and sometimes our customers are actually development partners um, that, that keeps things really focused and really tangible, really pragmatic, which, which I like. Very cool. Uh, so Nada, uh, how do you see the role of a data scientist you know, changing or shifting in you know, five, 10, even 15 uh, years? All right, uh, so I think there's a lot of changes that are currently happening to the field, and for sure, big data is the sexy thing out there, and I don't think that's gonna change for a while. Um, if you don't trust me, trust the statistics, so. Um, but I think, in general, we're seeing a lot of regulation on privacy. I think that's gonna be more and more important going forward, and I think as a data scientist, we're exposed to a lot of very privileged information, and. Um, there's going to be more and more scrutiny on the data, which I, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. It just means that we do need to understand how to gather that data, collect it, and secure it in a way that's beneficial to us in the future. Um, Angelica, you were talking about you know facial recognition data being non-anonymized, and I think I think. You know, we can't really keep data for, for very long periods of time going forward. So um, we, we need to start coming up with creative ways to keep data and be able to anonymize it in a way that's fairly secure and, you know, in, in a way that would render it beneficial for us going forward. Because looking at the last month of data is not very um, helpful to anyone. We want to be able to see the historical data. We want to be able to go back years um, in time, but uh, it all depends on privacy and how we manipulate and use the information out there. Awesome, very cool. Suzanne. So at Kindred and, well, now at Sanctuary, there's this new thing called brain engineering. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, so uh, Olivia mentioned it very briefly. Um, okay, so the, the idea behind brain engineering is that... Um, there, there, are, there are kind of two things we do. One is uh, like just code development. So we develop a bunch of source code, but then we also have um, a database system which stores all the, what we call configs for the robot's mind. Uh, and these can be, well, there's just, there's, there's literally thousands of them. So I can't go into them all in detail, but some examples of them might be things like um, the, uh, how many layers you have in a certain neural net in the part of the robot's brain might be like what kind of um, uh, neural units you're using even in those neural nets, something as detailed as that, or it could be something um, as abstract as what we call personality profile. So we have, I mentioned the reward function. When we're designing the reward function, we have like a weighting factor that weights how strongly that um, AI mind values physical reward over social reward over intellectual reward. So you can kind of do the whole Myers-Briggs thing or you can change the robot's personality just by changing these weighting factors. So it might be a, really, a robot that really craves social reward and, you know, it doesn't mind, like, um, standing in the rain, being cold, if it's, like, waiting for its friend, whereas it might be a very, like, physical, um, physically-minded robot. So all these are, like, parameters that you can change. And the uh, once the developers have written the code base, the source code doesn't really change much at all, but what does change is all these parameters and all these configs. So we call that process brain engineering. And I see the two things, the, the uh, software development and the, the brain engineering being two kind of separate jobs. And I used to think that the uh, code dev was the hard part and then brain <laughs> engineering was the easy part. But what I've been discovering is it's actually the other way around. Like, Okay, I'm not saying that like writing the code is easy. <laughs> Olivia's <laughs> gonna like slap me in a minute. But but I I discovered that actually tuning all these parameters and crafting a, a mind by changing these configs is actually really, really hard. And I think it's gonna require uh, thousands of people to do this in the future to actually find good. It's a bit like, I don't know if any of you are like machine learning or neural net people, but it's a bit like hyperparameter optimization. It's like really hard. You've got all these little uh, things that interact with one another and you have to use a lot of intuition about how to um, craft them. It's a bit more like a, a black magic than, than mm -hmm. sort of science at this point, but it's really fun. Very cool. Uh, so Olivia, 
Uh, so as we briefly heard tonight, reinforcement learning uh, is a branch of ML kind of inspired by behaviorist, behavioralist uh, psychology. And it's basically concerned with um, you know, how an agent, you know, robot, human, non-human, uh, takes an action in um, its environment to maximize a reward. So Olivia, can you talk about you know, RL uh, paradigms and why, why they work or you know, don't work in, uh, in robot minds? Yeah, sure. So uh, to start, Sarah mentioned deep learning. and. Um, Deep learning is essentially like a giant pattern recognizer, classifier, and has some really amazing superpowers, but also has some limitations. And so if you imagine something that is excellent at identifying cats in YouTube videos, and you ask it what it would like for breakfast, it's not gonna answer you. Um, so, so we need other kibble. We need other tools uh, to start asking questions rather than just um, being able to kind of identify these, these overarching patterns in, in the data set. So reinforcement learning is one tool that allows agents, agents here being like the AI agents, to make decisions about how they want to act in an environment. So the paradigm includes an agent, an environment, a state, which is the agent's perception of its environment. So that's a limited set of information. We also have a state that is like maybe accurate, maybe not accurate. Um, and then this notion of reward, which is a single scalar number over time that represents goodness or badness. Um, and the underlying function of what that reward signal is in the context of us, like if you think hard about that, like wait, 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 choosing breakfast for instance, <laughs> even that, um, the reward function underneath that is like quite complex. So, um, Reinforcement learning gives us this other power that uh, deep learning does not have. Uh, and the idea is it optimizes for actions that, that, that produce good reward in this environment. Um, it doesn't solve all the questions by any means, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a path in the right direction. Uh, in terms of what, when it works well and when it doesn't work well, so uh, generally reinforcement learning, in, ac in academia, reinforcement learning experiments are set up in a really nice kind of synchronous way. So agent takes action, uh, reward or no reward, and then it can take another action. It, 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 there's a change in the environment, in the state immediately, uh, and it can immediately assess whether that action was good. Uh, in the real world, that doesn't happen. Um, and so this, this question of reward allocation over time so if I like knock Suzanne, at the moment the reward is, is not negative, but maybe I'm going to get in trouble later. <laughs> yeah. and, and then how do, I, how do I attribute that reward back to the, to the action I took? I mean, um, as, a, as a learning system, that's really complicated. So those are the types of questions that become more of an issue when you move out of academia, uh, out of experiments, into something like a, a physical system, like a robot. Very cool. So just to conclude our night and our, and our panel discussion, uh, we're going to move into um, the Proust questionnaire. Now, how many people in the audience know what the Proust questionnaire is? Heard about it? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, well, now you're going to know. Uh, so the questionnaire was, you know, uh, a parlor game popularized by Marcel Proust. And uh, he believed that, you know, it's a set of questions, basically. And, and he believed that in answering these questions, you know, an individual reveals, you know, his or her true nature. Uh, so they're kind of a little bit random set of questions. Uh, but Vanity Fair actually has since popularized the game, um, the, the interview questionnaire, uh, by kind of uh, profiling, you know, individuals, you know, everyone from heads of state to, uh, you know, Bowie to Oprah and, and, and so on. Uh, so we're going to conclude with three uh, questions from the Proust questionnaire. Uh, and they're really interesting. And I kept things a little twee because I didn't want to go too, too dark <laughs> to end. Because <laughs> they do go dark. Like, they really go dark. Um, but maybe we can just start uh, from Olivia and then kind of go through the panel. And then, uh, and then we can end the night. And I'd like to keep the answers to, you know, very, you know, brevity here as a soul of what. So kind of 30 seconds or less. So what is your current state of mind? <laughs> and it can be one word. Often, you know, Bowie's used one word and everything. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, deep periwinkle optimism <laughs> with a tint of existential hunger. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> I think you... <laughs> I think my uh, state of mind would be optimistic about the future, usually is.
Um, I am inspired and interested and slightly scared and um, amused and in need of a drink. <laughs> Uh, I think my state of mind probably reflects my body, as I had mentioned before, which is, um, I should have gone to the bathroom before this. <laughs> <laughs> Same, actually. All right, a um, little bit of nervousness, but at the same time, very privileged to be here sitting next to these amazing women. Cool. Okay, question number two. Uh, let's start with Olivia. Uh, you know what? Yeah, let's 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 go this way. Let's switch it up. Um, what is your perfect idea of happiness? I, these are really hard, and these are the light ones. So you know, um, a sense, a perpetual sense of optimism, and a perpetual feeling of being relaxed. Um, this is going to sound. I don't know, but uh, gratitude. Um, I'm really into morning gratitudes where I say three things that I'm grateful for and in all of my hard times, sad times, difficult times, when I do the three gratitudes in the morning, I'm actually a lot happier. So it's all like relative um, and also massages is happiness. <laughs> uh, so I was gonna say reading, but that's Bowie's answer. Yeah, So I feel like is, I can't yeah. use that. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, old growth forests and salted caramels and dancing and kitties. Um, I think uh, it makes me really happy when like I have a cat on my lap that's purring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's just really ASMR, like, it's not, uh, but also being mindful and like kind of like looking into Buddhist teachings at the moment and it's really, really cool. So I think like being mindful and being like aware of the present moment and, and not being too hard on yourself and thinking you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, I have tendencies towards being a bit masochistic. So I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'd say like three days away from Christmas. I can extend that into all the other things, but you know, um, things on the horizon that are just a little bit too far to touch. Mm, very cool. Last question of the evening. Let's start with Olivia. What is your motto? <laughs> um, I, I prefer a mantra approach and that changes. So it is kind of made for the day. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to pick one, but I do. I do like the mantra idea. So, yeah. I kind of like the idea of uh, trying to do something that's never been done before, and trying to like kind of challenge, um, not just yourself, but challenge civilization. Like um, try and create things that have never been created, or explore places that have never been explored. So always, you know, try and do something like new on the frontier. Um, I don't think I have a motto, uh, but there's a quote by Arthur Ashe that I really, really like, which is, um, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And that's something I remind myself of. Just start. Uh, it's hard to choose, but um, one that I quite like is... Um, Alone you can go fast, but together you can go far. Uh, I like to consistently remind myself to challenge myself and that absolutely nothing is way too out of reach. Very cool. So on that note, thank you everyone. Kicking off year two.